we have a marvelous collaboration between Temple Bot Yam and our congregation, Sanibel Congregational United Church of Christ, rather symbolized this afternoon by the fact that it's Dave Wax, a member of Temple Bot Yam, who's handling the technical end of things for us. So thank you again to David for that, to Abby for her part in what we're about to present for you. As we think of songs of freedom, songs of hope, I want to speak with you this afternoon and sing with you this afternoon about spirituals. What W.E.B. Du Bois in the early part of the 20th century described as sorrow songs. Du Bois wrote one of the most important and influential books of the early 20th century when it came to race relations and was instrumental in the founding and work of the NAACP. Du Bois, in his best-known book, The Souls of Black Folks, has a marvelous essay that I encourage you to look up after this service called The Sorrow Songs. And I want to quote from that essay. Through all the sorrow of the sorrow songs, there breathes a hope a faith in the ultimate justice of things. The minor cadences of despair change often to triumph and calm confidence. Sometimes it is faith in life, sometimes a faith in death, sometimes assurance of boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear that sometime, somewhere, I don't know. men will judge men by their yeah. souls and not by their skins. W.E.B. Du Bois. A spiritual is a type of religious folk song. And when we hear the word spiritual in reference to music, it's usually associated with the enslaved people of Africa who worked especially in the American South. From the late decades of the 18th century to the 1860s, these songs began to coalesce and take shape. The term spiritual came from the King James Version of the Bible, in particular Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, where we read, As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, it's from that section of Scripture that the term spirituals or spiritual songs comes. The spirituals were rooted in informal gatherings of slaves in what were called praise houses and outdoor meetings called brush arbor or bush or camp meetings where singing, chanting, dancing, trances were all part of a religious experience that combined the spirituality of Africa and the many different spiritualities of Africa with Christianity. There were ring shouts, uh, shuffling circle dances with chanting and clapping. It was a time and a space and a place where enslaved people, free from the immediate oversight of their masters, were able to express themselves fully. And music, was very much a part of that. Music, which is very much a part of how most of us experience our inner lives. Enslaved people, of course, were brought to the New World from Western Africa, beginning actually in the 1500s, to this country, or what would become this country, now famously in 1619. Those owned by Christians in colonial and antebellum America were forbidden any religion but Christianity. 
And of course, most of them, most all of them, came to this country with some religious expression, whether it was animism or it was Islam, some religious expression, but those were all denied. Church attendance on many, many plantations was compulsory, and when it was in town, those who were enslaved sat in the balconies. Uh, sometimes the owners themselves preached to those who were enslaved on their plantations and taught them what they wanted them to believe, what they wanted them to understand, highlighting any passage in Scripture that seemed to approve of, condone, or promote slavery. Only the owner's language was allowed in worship. Music had been central to the life of the enslaved people here when they were in Africa. Important life events were marked by special chants, special songs, special music, and everyday activities were often laced with music. In Christian services, one could hear echoes of African religion, a call and response, for instance, where a leader would sing a line and then the assembled would sing it back. One sees this reflected, especially in this country's history, in work songs, as people made their way through cotton fields picking the cotton. One of them would sing a line and others would sing in response. And often what they were singing had those who were overseeing their work understood would have been very much disapproved of. Particular biblical stories were fascinating to the folks who had come here for some pretty obvious reasons. The story of the exile and the captivity in Babylon. Obvious why that would be so moving. The story of David and Goliath, how the little guy is able to conquer the big one. The story of Moses and the people escaping from slavery in Egypt and their time in wilderness. Familiar themes in spirituals. Indeed, Moses, a name that was sometimes used to describe perhaps the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad, that area, that route that allowed people to move from the south into the free north, that famous conductor, none other than Harriet Tubman, who was often referred to as Moses. And then themes of salvation, Jesus, heaven, a better place, a different place. These are all themes that get reflected in spirituals, in spirituals like a go down Moses, for instance. Go down Moses. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. It is a spiritual, of course, that later would embolden those in the civil rights movement as well. The spirituals really were largely hidden until after the Civil War, and interestingly, I imagine to those of you who are part of the Unitarian Universalist group in particular, it was a Unitarian minister, Thomas Wentworth Higgins, who first really brought to light in terms of white attention to the spirituals the work that was so important here. He wrote an article in 1867 called simply Negro Spirituals that appeared in Atlantic Monthly. The other way that the spirituals really began to take root and become better known among folks in the North and people outside of those who had been enslaved was through the work of Fisk University. Fisk, one of the historically black colleges and universities in this country, was founded in 1866, so right after the Civil War. But by 1871, they had run into financial problems. And so a music professor who also happened to be the treasurer of Fisk pulled together a nine-member chorale 
so that they might hold concerts and raise money, much needed funds, for the university. They had as part of their repertoire spirituals, and their fame began to spread as they began to concertize. In fact, it was only in the next year, 1872, when they made their first appearance in the White House, singing for, for Grant's White House. They toured Europe in that same year, and in 1875, raised sufficient funds to build Jubilee Hall on the Fisk campus. The group, of course, still exists to this day, one of the finest chorales in all of the nation, the Fisk Jubilee Singers. It is through them and others who followed, people like Paul Robeson and H.T. Burley, that the spirituals really have become better known, better documented, and more firmly rooted in our culture as a nation. I want to share with you this afternoon four spirituals, sing for you four, tell you a wee little bit about each one. One of the things that was significant about the spirituals was the way that they could express so eloquently some of the feelings that were often held deep inside and not able to be expressed without fear of punishment. One of those feelings, one of those emotions, is hard for most of us, I suspect, to imagine. An enslaved person who was brought to this country usually had left behind in Africa older parents, grandparents, and of course, the ancestors, those who'd gone before. And once they were here and had children of their own, at the drop of a hat, children could be separated from their parents and sold, sold to others. And so it was not at all uncommon for children to be in one place, and parents uh, to be in another. It is perhaps a theme that resonates especially strongly today in a different setting for different reasons. It is out of that sense of anguish, and also out of a sense of something vital has been taken from me, and I feel like I am just withering away into nothing. What is that? That this, one of the most powerful, pungent of the spirituals, emerges. Sometimes I feel like a, mother. like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home, a long ways from home. A home, a long way from home. Sometimes I feel like 
I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. A long way from home. A long way from After the Civil War, during the period known as Reconstruction, many grand promises were made. Promises around voting rights, promises around being able to serve in public office, promises around reparations, land that would be restored, land that would be given. Forty acres was promised, forty acres and famously a mule, enough to start one's own farm. But politics being what they were and what they often are to this day, those promises were eventually broken. A brigadier general came down to the Sea Islands off of the Carolina coast to give this word to those formerly enslaved folks who lived there, that the land they had been promised wasn't going to be given to them. Du Bois tells that as that general came, a throng gathered to hear what they had anticipated would be good news. But when he told them, no, the land would not be forthcoming, an old woman who stood in the midst of the crowd began to sing. And soon all the others gathered there, joined their voices with hers in what can best be described as a lament. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Nobody 
Nobody knows my sorrow I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Many of the spirituals were in code, if you will, with explicit directions about how one could escape north to freedom. Rivers are often mentioned uh, in the wonderful spiritual Deep River, for instance. I want to go over into Campground. Well, Campground was the other side of the Ohio River and represented freedom. One of the best known of the spirituals and most detailed of the spirituals in terms of its encoded secret language was follow the drinking gourd. And let me just refer to a few of those coded references in it so that you might better appreciate this particular spiritual. When the sun come back, it begins quite eloquently, when the sun come back is a reference to spring. This is the time on the cusp of winter and spring when one should plan one's escape. When the first quail call, this refers to breeding season. Quail in Alabama, and that's where this song is believed to have originated. Quail in Alabama start calling to each other in early to mid-April. So early in the spring, Early April, make your run. And then the famous line, follow the drinking gourd. Of course, it refers to the fact that gourds were hollowed out and literally used as dippers, as drinking gourds. But the drinking gourd being referred to here wasn't made out of a gourd. It was made out of stars. And the Big Dipper, of course, points its way to the North Star. Follow the drinking gourd, and you'll follow the North Star, and you'll make your way towards freedom. Later on in the chorus, there's a reference to the old man. Well, the old man is nautical slang for captain, and one of the operatives of the Underground Railroad was Peg Leg Joe, who was formerly a sailor. And probably it's Peg Leg Joe who's being referred to as one who would help guide those who were escaping along the Underground Railroad. There is in the third verse, we're not singing all the verses, in the third verse, a description is laid out of the route through northeastern Mississippi through Tennessee, the headwaters of the Tombigbee River, and near Woodall Mountain, the high point in Mississippi. The river ends between two hills, the song says. You need to be watching for this particular mark, this landmark. And then later it says, another river on the other side. Well, the other river on the other side of the hills in Tennessee would have been where one should have gone. So, Follow the drinking gourd, a bit of instruction for enslaved persons seeking to use the Underground Railroad, that, that series of stops along the way to Canada sometimes and sometimes to the northern part of the U.S. where one could be free. Just as an interesting note, by the way, one of those stopping points along the way was the synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. And right under the bima, if you go there, a tour guide will show you, right under the bima, one can lift up a trap door and see the space that was used as part of the Underground Railroad. Follow the drinking gourd.
when the sun comes back and the first quail calls follow the drinking gourd for the old man's waiting for to carry you to freedom follow the drinking gourd follow the drinking gourd follow the drinking gourd for the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom follow the drinking gourd where the river ends in between two hills follow the drinking gourd there's another river on the other side follow the drinking gourd follow the drinking gourd follow the drinking gourd for the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom follow the drinking gourd Many of the spirituals not only were encoded, but they also carried a deep religious and spiritual significance. Steal Away is one of those. It is this powerful, powerful spiritual that speaks about home in two ways. It speaks about stealing away to freedom, though in a coded way, but it also talks about the freedom of death and what might come after, steal away to Jesus, the words go. It is a powerful, powerful piece, and indeed so powerful that in 1831 in Virginia, when Nat Turner assembled many enslaved persons to engage in a rebellion, an uprising, this was the spiritual that was sung to let people know the time had come. It proved, obviously, if you know your history, to be a faded time, and Turner would eventually give up his life for it. But listen for the hope and the strength that is reflected in Steal Away. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. My Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Green trees are bending, 
poor sinner stands a trembling. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Still away, still away, still away to Jesus. Still away, still away home. I ain't got long to stay here. My Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the lightning. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Still away, still away, still away to Jesus. Still away, still away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Du Bois uh, closes his essay with these words, and let me close our presentation with them as well. Around us, the history of the land has centered for thrice a hundred years. Out of the nation's heart, we have called all that was best to throttle and subdue all that was worst. Fire and blood, prayer and sacrifice have billowed over this people and they have found peace only in the altars of the God of right. Nor has our gift of the Spirit been merely passive. Actively, we have woven ourselves with the very warp and woof of this nation. We fought their battles, shared their sorrow, mingled our blood with theirs, and generation after generation have pleaded with the headstrong, careless people to despise not justice, mercy, and truth, lest the nation be smitten with a curse. Our song, our toil, our cheer and warning have been given to this nation in blood brotherhood. Are not these gifts worth the giving? Is not this work and striving? Would America have been America without her Negro people? Even so is the hope that sang in the songs of my father well sung. If somewhere in the whirl and chaos of things there dwells eternal good, pitiful yet masterful, then anon, in his good time, America shall rend the veil and the prisoned shall go free, free. Free as the sunshine trickling down the morning into these high windows of mine. Free as yonder fresh young voices welling up to me from the caverns of brick and mortar below, swelling with song, instinct with life, tremulous treble and darkening bass. Songs of freedom, songs of hope, sorrow songs, songs of the Spirit. Might they empower you 
in ways that they have empowered so many down through the centuries. And might we all remember that the work that Du Bois and so many others spoke of and sang of is far from over. Peace be with you. Uh, did you not hear me? Okay. I said if all those that are members of the UU would stay online afterwards, why I'd love to be able to chat with you. Um, thank you, John Danner and Abigail. We really have appreciated all your efforts. It was very interesting. Loved it. Bye-bye. <laughs>